Um, it's our workshop. Our workshop is um, really with the goal of encouraging your intentionality as you plan your winter enrollment, but also as you start to think about your program planning beyond winter quarter. And our hope is that you're going to walk away feeling more comfortable, more confident about and navigating all of the ups and downs, the tips and tricks, and the various issues that are going to be related to winter enrollment. We'll start by going uh, and navigating through some of the My UCLA and Class Planner resources. We'll talk about specific tips and tricks to enrollment, and then we'll really get into some of our strategic program planning and how to engage with that program planning with intention. Uh, we'll really be relying on the worksheet for that. And then we'll finish up with some helpful resources and talking about how you can stay in contact with your academic, academic advising support. Awesome. Before we get too far into it though, we're gonna take a moment just to acknowledge how we're all feeling about enrollment. Uh, enrollment it can bring a lot of feelings. It's a really wild time of the quarter. Some of you may still be working on midterms or maybe recovering from midterms and you're already being asked to think about what you're enrolling in for next quarter. So if you're comfortable, share here in the chat or you can refer back to the worksheet so that you have this as like a, a log of how you're feeling now that you can refer back to. Um, you can share a sentence, you can share a word, or you can even make an emoji like you can here on Slack to share how you're feeling about enrollment coming up. If folks are feeling anxious, we're hoping that you'll be able to refer back to that feeling uh, towards the end of our towards the end of our workshop or towards the end of your preparation cycle for enrollment and and feel a lot less anxious. Thank you all for sharing. I'm glad to see that excitement is coming through in the chat uh, along with the, the anxiety that we're feeling with, with this element. Yeah. So that's perfectly normal, by the way, to feel nervous about it. Um, a midterm in 10 minutes, oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> um, you're, we're gonna have to figure that one out, but um, Enrollment's gonna happen a little bit differently this time around than in orientation or for fall quarter. Uh, UCLA operates on a two-pass system um, and uh, it's kind of prioritized by priority pass and then first pass, second pass. And um, first pass, it, it happens in order basically like seniors with 160 units already and a declared term and then the rest of seniors and juniors and then sophomores and then freshmen and it's all based on your units that you have and um, that's how your passes are um, assigned and sometimes people are like how come my pass is so late well within that group of seniors or juniors it's a big group if your passes are random randomly assigned within that um, but rest assured you are competing against only people at the same um, class level as you for those classes. All right, so in first pass, you'll be able to add up to 10 units. Um, usually, departments will restrict classes to their majors. So for example, uh, if you want to enroll in a math class, you might need to be a math major or a math minor to access upper division math courses. In second pass, often, um, not only can you enroll up to 19 units, but those departments will then open their restrictions so that more majors can enroll in them. Um, yeah, so the 19 units is not that you have to take 19 units. It's more that you have 19 units to play with um, so that if you are added onto like a wait list for a class that you really want, that will count towards your 19 units, but it's not technically enrolled. So you wanna make sure to use your units to enroll in a backup class so that you're fully enrolled in at least 12 units at all times. Um, Whoops, I am losing windows. Okay. Hmm. So there is this cool video that's sort of going through things here. Um, I think that first I want to pause it and go to the worksheet for a second where you are, where you had put down how you're feeling right now and kind of think about your first pass and second pass and identify what, if you know the days and times for that. This video will kind of show you how to find your enrollment appointments on um, my UCLA. Um, and it kind of goes through it quickly, but you also have access to this and that link that Sheehan shared at the beginning, the tiny URL, that's going to give you access to all of these resources. And then you can take more time to read it um, or to go through it more slowly, to pause. Um, 
but we'll just keep going. So you see it's under uh, plan and enroll on my UCLA. Okay, so go ahead for yourself and put down your first and second pass so that you can organize when that is. And definitely let us know if anyone's having trouble finding that or can I get a thumbs up if everybody knows their, if you know your pastimes. All right, cool. Sorry if you hear dogs barking. Um, all right, fantastic. So now that you know you have a first and second pass, um, what does that really mean? <laughs> what do you should you do in those passes? Okay. So um in first pass. You know, you're since you only have 10 units, you're usually enrolling in about two classes. Um, this is where you can see also this is information is on the worksheet just below those enrollment passes. And um, you kind of want to prioritize classes for your majors because those are the ones that impact your time to degree and being able to finish. Um, you also want to prioritize classes that you might think um, fill up quickly or have limited offerings. And you can identify these by talking to your department counselor to find out like, are there any sequences that are only offered once a year? Are there any um, fixed, like kind of only once a quarter, like once a year offerings and or if there are any changes, like they're gonna kind of know that sort of thing. So you can prioritize your classes. Um, and also if you're using a resource like Bruin Walk, if, and a professor has really high ratings across the board, just know that every other student on campus in, is gonna be gunning for that class as well. So make sure that you have alternates in mind. Um, most requisites and co-requisites are enforced. And so make sure that you have um, completed them or that you are currently enrolled in them. Um, and we'll talk about if you have any trouble with that. Um, and also, like I said, the enrollment restrictions uh, might be restricted to specific majors. For second pass, that's where you can enroll in up to 19 units, contract courses. If you have a PTE number, I would say that for second pass because that it guarantees you enrollment um, and waitlisted courses, you know, um, and alternates. You wanna just make sure to use that time. Some and if you have any questions, huh? I'm just gonna mention some of the things to, to check against are scheduling conflicts. So in your first pass, mm -hmm. your goal is to enroll in two courses. You're also going to have alternates for each of your top two choices for first pass. And amongst all those alternates, you'll be doing kind of the same thing, checking checking course restrictions, checking uh, enrollment district restrictions and prerequisites, as well as conflicts with other courses that are in your plan. Um, the class planner is another one of those tools that Alina mentioned under my UCLA classes plan and enroll. And that really helps you to visualize this. Um, but in addition to checking to make sure your time class times are not conflicting, we also want to highlight check to make sure your finals are not conflicting if you're enrolling in these courses. Yeah. Um, it's rare that you're able to find accommodations for conflicting finals. You definitely want to double check that. And they're posted at the beginning of when the schedule goes live. All right, Shannon. It's I think we'll kind of just go through this video. So this video will show us the class planner. I just mentioned it. It is again on my UCLA uh, available under, it's under classes okay. and then uh, oh. find and enroll. And it's got some really cool features. So as they kind of pop up on the video here, I'm gonna highlight each feature as it goes. Um, the class planner is used for specific quarters. So make sure you're looking at winter 2024, which we're enrolling for, it's our upcoming quarter. You can search classes just like um, we do in the schedule of classes. And that includes options to see additional information. 
go ahead. Uh, will this recording be sent out? Yes, we will send out this recording. So, you, uh, and all of this information is also available in the link since this video is going pretty fast. Some of the features that we do like to feature on the class planner are the searching. So as you're searching for classes that are going to be part of your first pass plan, you'll be going through and, and finding those classes and checking the information. And that can all be done from the class planner. There are filters available to show you only particular types of classes. You can search for particular requirements. If you know you're going to be prioritizing general education requirement, for example, you can search for that requirement. If you know that you're prioritizing a particular okay. course, you can search by that um, course subject. Once uh, you have some courses kind of picked out, you can even use a class planner to get course detail information. And that is the page that you can kind of confirm some of the things that we talked about in the last slide. So things like, does this course have prerequisites? Is this course gonna be restricted only to students in a particular major? That information is also gonna be available on the class planner. Um, I think if the video pauses, or we can see it right here, actually, that um, error, correct, I, I'm going to call it error or warning icon with the circle uh, on our image screen here. If you press that, or if you press the link to lecture one, you'll be, you'll get drop down information such as course requisites. Like for this course, we can see that a number of courses are required before you're able to enroll in it. And these are all things that you can check straight from the class planner, as well as seeing if the classes are um, interacting with each other on your timeline. I'm not, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to highlight on this page? That is everything. All right. So I'm going to pause. Make sure that you watch that video. Sorry that it's kind of hectic. Um, but that's why we're giving you the links to everything so you can spend more time actually following the directions on how to like find the information to help you make these choices. And I, sorry, Shane, I think I took one of your slides, but. <laughs> you did, but go for it. <laughs> so this is like um, kind of like additional notes to keep in mind. Uh, you know, there's two different tools you can use. So look up classes, there's your class planner, and there's also the schedule of classes, the public schedule of classes. That's something that anyone can access. That's what I would have access to um, if I'm looking up a class, but all of it will include information um, about the final exams, any enrollment restrictions, um, whether or not the credit will count towards, you know, a GE or other university requirements. Um, but only on class planner can you actually enroll in the class or exchange sections. So um, you can add things to your planner before your enrollment pass, but you are not enrolled just because something is on your class planner. You actually have to interact with that um, listing on your class planner to click enroll to be enrolled. And so there is a difference between what you see on class planner and what you're actually enrolled in. You can actually switch views to study lists so that way you can see what you're actually in. I've had students before make that mistake where like, well, I'm in this class and I'm like, you're not enrolled. And they had no idea because they were using their class planner and just assumed um, that they had. So just be, that's the one thing that I would say, as long as you're checking that stuff and being diligent about the details, then it shouldn't be that stressful and you'll, um, you, you will like, you know, avoid some of that. Um, there's a question about enrolling in a course during your first pass that's not for your major, but for your minor. Um, you can enroll in any class in your passes. That's going to be completely your choice, right? Whether or not it's um, recommended depends on, you know, kind of like the course loads you can handle. Are you on track to graduate on time? Are you going to be able to easily finish that minor, you know, um, since that's kind of like an extra elective thing that you're adding on to. So as long as you're able to still make there. progress in your major, go ahead. Are you, are you declared with a minor? We talked a lot about these restrictions. If you're not yet in the minor declared, you might have trouble adding those courses in your first pass. Yeah, so um, the other thing that's really nice about the schedule of classes and class planner is there's usually a navigation bar where you can filter your results. You can filter by upper division, you can filter by days and times. Um, you know, I kind of like making a list of all the classes that you could enroll in and then um, building from there, you know, and that gives you your alternates and whatnot. This is me also. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. 
So yeah, talking about major versus minor, that was actually amazing timing. Rachel asked that question. Um, so how do you kind of program plan? How do you kind of decide what you're going to pick for first and second pass? Um, you know, for your major, you definitely want to finish any prep courses because that'll increase your flexibility for your upper division classes, hopefully. Some majors are a lot more structured. And so you there isn't a lot of wiggle room to be creative with your schedule. You kind of have like a series that you will be completing. Um, but the good news about that is that typically um, you're still able to make progress um, in those classes, maybe not exactly in the, the lecture or professor that you want, um, but you will be able to make degree progress. Um, you can also use GE classes to kind of help balance your schedule. If you don't have IGETC, if you have IGETC, then you don't have any more GEs. The one thing to check is, do you have American history and institutions, or do you have a diversity a course that's satisfying your diversity requirement? Then you could use those two classes. Um, and this is where I want to say you definitely want to check with your major and minor advisor regarding your course options and availability, as well as any eligibility. So if you run, you're trying to enroll and it says you have not met the requisite for this, but you know you took that class and it transferred in, that's where you would talk to your major or the department of the class you're trying to add and talk to them about your credit because they can help you enroll um, from there. Uh, minor electives and exploration. Um, yeah, we'll talk about kind of how to find college advisors in your departments. That's definitely a part of this presentation. Um, if you have GE courses left, you can use that to explore areas of interest and it's still counting for your towards your degree. Um, another way that you can also explore is through upper division electives. So everyone still has to have um, 60 upper division units before you graduate. And so um, a lot of you, your majors will have something like 44 to 40 upper division units, some more, some less. And so you will have to take probably some upper division electives to fill that gap to 60. And that's another way that you can kind of explore and diversify your transcript um, to have your interest showed there. And just keep in mind that um, a good part about being at a research university like UCLA is that you are gaining, whether or not you do research formally, you're gaining these amazing transferable skills like critical thinking, problem solving, um, and so therefore there's not a really strong tie between your the name of your major and the career that you end up in. So you definitely wanna make sure that you have um, a major that aligns with your interests and passions and values that and strengths, right? Um, and keeping in mind what UCLA has to offer as far as opportunities and what you wanna get from that experience um, and you'll be in a good spot for any career. All right, um, definitely keep the questions coming. Um, the upper division electives, that is you do need 60 units that are numbered 100 to 199. So something that has to be at least 100 in the number will count towards upper divisions. So whether it's for your major or an elective, any 100 level class will count for those units. All right. We talked about prerequisites and if they don't transfer in, who to talk to, and we'll kind of go into more detail about actually connecting. Um, you know, uh, I do think that if you are not familiar with your department major, your department's website and the resources available there, a lot of them will have specific major tips and tricks for enrolling. I know that um, I definitely had that posted when I used to be the CS counselor. Um, so you definitely want to kind of familiarize with um, those resources, familiarize yourself with those resources as well. And we will kind of um, go back to some of these questions too at the end. We'll have plenty of time to delve in a little bit deeper for anything that we maybe covered a little bit too quickly or that you still have questions about. All right. Let's switch over to... All right, so I feel like I keep talking about these things a little bit before the slide, but basically 
Um, you want a balanced schedule, right? So asking yourself, how is this quarter going? Um, has it, we recommended that you be in three classes for your first quarter so that you could have time to also like join clubs, meet people, explore a little bit. Um, maybe you are in four classes, whatever you're enrolled in right now, you want to kind of ask, how is that going, right? Are you able to handle more? And if you're not, what does that look like as far as planning out your classes? Um, exploration is really is good because you might find something that you had no idea that you were interested in. And that's where you can use your electives and any GE that you might have or diversity um, or, or AHI to kind of explore. Um, if you know that your classes are gonna be really time consuming, that maybe you don't wanna take more than two, you know, that quarter and then supplement with something else. As far as what those classes are, that is something you need to talk to your major counselor about because they'll say, they'll know exactly which classes students say take the most time, that you don't want to pair together to have a balanced schedule or ones that you want to spread out. They can be a really great resource for that. You also want to be open and realistic, right? Knowing that you may not get into every single class that you want um, or the fact that you might be planning a class for next fall and it's not offered in next fall when the schedule goes live. So you need to have also some flexibility. And this is where I was saying, talking again to your major counselor about the fixed points in your major. What are things that you have to take in certain quarters that cannot be changed, that are not flexible, and then everything else can be flexible and kind of built around those fixed points. Um, and also, you know, take into consideration when you're balancing your schedule, that um, you have more commitments than just classes, right? So if you have a job and you're working a ton of hours, if you're commuting, how much time is that gonna take from your, from your um, studies? If you are you know, running a club or something, you wanna consider all of those things um, as sort of like your other class that you're enrolled in. So that if you're enrolled in four classes and you have all these other commitments, you're really gonna be balancing more like a five or six class load. Um, of just as far as your own uh, time and energy. The other thing you wanna do is plan ahead. A lot of times um, for students who are looking at their electives, I might say to them, well, make a list of like all the electives you might be interested in. Are there any that have a lot of um, requisites that you would have to take and how, and does that fit into the quarters that you have left to reach that requisite? Um, you know, but also look ahead to internships and research, recruitment, advising, like, do you want to study abroad? All of that early planning will be helpful um, just so that you have an idea. You're not like surprised by anything super last minute, um, you know, but it still gives you that flexibility to be open to new opportunities that you may not have considered before. Um, and then again, like I was saying, being familiar with your options. So deadlines, you know, course distinctions. The other thing that's in the class planner and the course information, I mean, is if the class impacted or not. There's literally a section that says impacted and then below it will say yes or no. And that will impact your drop deadlines for those courses, like impacted classes you need to drop by week two, Friday. Um, and then after that, you would need a petition to be able to drop an impacted course. For your rest of your classes, you have um, week four, uh, to drop a class at week seven with a notation, you can still drop those non-impacted classes and you can still drop beyond that. You get up to three restricted drops, which are going to be week eight or later. All right, so we'll go into this more. Don't, I know it's a lot of information, but it's going to be okay. So from here, rather, unfortunately, rather than taking a step back, we're actually going to take a huge step forward and talk really a little bit about not just planning for next quarter, but overall thinking about ourselves as students and the time that we spend here at UCLA and what we want to become during our time here at UCLA and how we want to prepare ourselves for our time here at UCLA. If we refer now back to our worksheet, we're going to be doing a couple minutes of work here in the worksheet. Don't worry if you don't finish a section, but I really ask that you all kind of give it um, what they call the old college try. D do take a few moments here and we're gonna together take about five to 10 minutes to work on the next few sections of this worksheet together. Feel free to unmute and share at certain points when, when, when we call for that, um, because we'll ask folks to share back about each of these next sections. 
the first place that I want you to spend just about three minutes, maybe a minute on each of these words is to list some words that you feel best describe you now. Think of all that you've done to get here at UCLA and the ways that you can best describe yourself and go ahead and jot those down in the worksheet so that you can refer back to them in a couple of minutes. I'll give everyone just a couple of minutes here. And then if you have some really great ones that you wanna share, we're gonna save that until, uh, until we talk about the, th the ways we might wanna change actually. As folks think about how, how you can best describe yourself now, and as you're looking towards that next question, the ways that you might want to, you might hope to best describe yourself at the end of your time at UCLA. Um, I'll take a just a brief moment to look into these questions here. In terms of contacting your college counselors, we'll have lots of contact information available in the last few slides of our presentation here. Um, but the contact page on our website is always a great place to find yourself if you're looking to contact college academic level counselors. And I'll go ahead and share that in the chat now. As we finish up three words or short phrases that describe who we are today, I also want us to think about three words or short phrases that describe who we want to become when we complete our journey here at UCLA, whether that's, you know, less than six quarters from now for those of us who are planning to graduate early or if it's seven quarters from now for those of us who are going to be planning to graduate right there at the um at the last quarter of eligibility for time to degree let's list some of the words that we hope will describe us in this next section by graduation and if you're you know certainly there can be repeats i think in a lot of ways you'll hope to become you'll hope to become more of the same person you already are but let's see if any of those words shift a little bit as you think of yourself in the next few years And does anyone want to share some of the made some of the shifts that they noticed as they describe themselves now and, and describe themselves as they would like to become? No worries and no pressure. I know it can be a lot to share in front of the whole group here, but that's the beauty of the worksheet. So you'll have this for yourself to be able to refer back to. We're also going to move into this next section, setting goals with intention. We've kind of broken down, and you can see on your screen here, we're breaking down our thinking into three areas of our time for the next two years at UCLA. We're thinking of our time academically. So what are some academic goals that we might have? That can be, you know, really straightforward. I hope all of your academic goal is to complete your degree in the next, in your time at UCLA. Um, but are you looking to add things to your degree? Are you looking to add to your major with minors or other experiences in those academic areas? These might be um, things that you list here in the academic goals. So in addition to completing my degree, my one of my academic goals might be to get experience in research so that I know if I want to go on and do grad, grad research experience, I, I might want to get a taste of that as an undergraduate. Go ahead and take another minute here just to finish off and, and, and add in a few more academic goals if you feel like you've already finished. The next area of goal setting can sound really broad. Personal goals, what all does it mean? Certainly we're envisioning it in terms of your personal well-being, goals that relate to your health, your, your sense of well-being, your ability to your ability to move forward on professional and academic goals are going to be intricately tied to your ability to maintain your personal goals, I would say. So does it so we would be thinking about maybe examples like um, a personal goal of maintaining an exercise routine that can be helpful for for your well-being or maintaining well, we'll get into some practices that folks suggest, or we'll look. We'll be looking to hear from you all in terms of how you maintain your personal well-being. But we'll, these are goals that you'll want to maintain a priority of alongside your academic goals and your professional goals at UCLA.
And our last category of kind of intentional goals that we're hoping to jot down a few things for our time at UCLA is professional goals. You're learning a lot at UCLA, but you're also preparing yourself to work eventually someday to work in, in whatever field it is that calls to you. So consider when we're adding in some professional goals, things that uh, are not necessarily during your time at UCLA. Do you have a goal for the first thing that you want to do after leaving UCLA? Do you have a goal for what you want to do professionally five years from now? And as we get into engaging with those goals, we'll talk about what that means with your time here at UCLA. Let me know if I'm moving too fast for folks, but once we have a few ideas of goals that we have in each of these areas, we're able to really move into the next section of our worksheet and engage with those goals intentionally, which means we're gonna to wanna to specify some specific things that we can do with our time at UCLA that will allow us to make progress to those goals or to feel that we're interacting with those goals in a meaningful way, uh, or to feel that we're preparing to, for those goals in a meaningful way. So we'll continue the breakdown and now we'll be answering some of the questions that you directly see in our presentation actually on the screen. For example, with your academic goals, We'll ask you, how will you engage with the academic goals that you set in that last section? Which is to say, aside from your degree requirements, how are you gonna engage in opportunities that inform your academic interests? Does anyone wanna share an academic goal? And we might be able to do a little bit of group thinking about how you might be engaging with it intentionally. Totally okay if no one wants to share. I'm happy to give a hypothetical. From my time as a student, one of my goals was to learn a new language. And that would be one of my academic goals at UCLA. Does anyone have ideas on how I could have intentionally interacted with that goal and what sorts of resources I might have I might have interacted with? Well, as it relates to winter quarter enrollment, I might have found somewhere in winter quarter enrollment, whether it's first pass or second pass, which depend on my strategy, to fit in a language class. Since it's winter quarter, it might be tough to start on level one of a language. So that, again, would require some of that pre-planning that Alina was alluding to, which might mean that if it's if I was in the situation today, it might mean that my goal is actually to start French one in fall quarter and to prepare and to make sure that my schedule is going to be open and prepared by the time I get to fall quarter to allow me to enroll in fall in, in French one at that time. Some of the resources that I might interact with, definitely the French department, right? If I'm interested in, in learning that language, I'll definitely want to interact with that department. And the same goes for any other minor or, or, or academic interests you might have. If you're interested in learning how to map using some GIS systems, you're going to want to interact with the geog department and the GIS minor, even ahead of being in that minor, to understand what sorts of resources they might have available. I can speak at least for the French department and say I joined the French club pretty simple one, but a great resource that's available on campus as a student organization that furthered my academic goals. As we move into personal goals, this might be a little bit trickier, but there are definitely some resources that are available on campus that can help you further those personal goals. I am a running nut, so of course I talked about exercise as the way to maintain my wellness. Well, I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the resources available on campus in terms of exercise. Maybe I would write down John Wooden Center there or checking out the hours available at Drake Stadium for running on the track. There's resources like CAPS, the Council, uh, Counseling and Psychological Services Office to connect with mental health resources. There are resources like RISE, which is um, resiliency in the student experience to help us overcome some of the more difficulty, the more difficult but kind of acute difficulties that we experience while we're here at UCLA and rise to those levels with resilience. And finally, we'll move into how we might interact really intentionally with our professional goals. Similarly, does anyone want to share an example here before we move into a hypothetical? No problem. 
let's say one of our hypothetical professional goals is to be a lawyer someday. If I want to become a lawyer after my time at UCLA and obviously after law school as well, there are things I'm going to want to be doing during my time at UCLA to start engaging intentionally with that goal. One thing might be to learn a little bit more about what it is to be a lawyer other than just seeing them on TV, if that's been my only experience with them so far. So that might be highlighting things like internships in law offices or joining student organizations that are focused on pre-law and can connect you with current law students as mentors. Although you won't be taking any law classes at UCLA as an undergrad, there are definitely ways to interact with even these professional and kind of very professional uh, postgraduate professional goals while you're an undergraduate here at UCLA. Does anyone, we're going to go ahead and move away from this section and back to more of a regimented presentation in a moment. I hope you all have found it helpful to kind of jot down some of these ideas and jot down some of these goals. We'll, of course, have a Q&A section towards the end here. Um, so if you have some goals in your mind, but not sure what resources you'll, you'll want to interact with so that you can intentionally make your way towards those goals, those are some great questions for us as we move towards the end of this presentation as well. But for now, I'll kick it back over, I believe, to Alina. Thank you. Could we just get like a quick temperature check, like maybe a thumbs up if you, um, if you're kind of like understanding the connections that we're trying to draw here, or if it's a little bit over your head, that's totally okay too. Being like, I, you know, that's also fine. It is a lot to think about. Um, you thought you're coming in here just for enrollment, but we're not going to tell you what to enroll in. It's a lot more about what is it that you're trying to achieve here. And how can UCLA support you? What opportunities are here to get you there? So this is where it's important for when you ask questions, like Natalie earlier was like, is there a list of electives that I can choose from? No, but also it's very tailored to what your specific goals are, you know? So if you come in being like, I know I want to go to law school and there is no law things, you can talk to different people. And then you, in mind, you're keeping that in mind as you're trying to collect these experiences, courses that might support, um, blocking out time for yourself um, accordingly for your wellness and whatnot. All right, so we did have kind of questions about how to connect with your advisors. Who are your advisors? What can, how can they help you with various things? So all of us in the College of um, college Academic Counseling are college advisors. It's more about your university requirements, your overall degree, um, I get see, you know, if if you're not sure about the major that you're in, or maybe you need to switch majors or your or your plans have changed, you've discovered something new. We're the ones who are gonna kind of talk you through the process of like what's possible in the time you have left, what can we um, connect you to because we also, you don't have to memorize all the resources at UCLA and I don't have to memorize, but I do know how to connect to them and how to find them, um, with a lot more experience, um, than you would have had in one quarter. Right. So we're also going to be a little bit more on the developmental side of just like, you know, um, like I said, what is it that you're trying to get out of your time here and what are the different ways that you maybe didn't think of that could get you there? right? Um, you might not know that of a resource that's available that is going to pop into our heads as soon as you say, I'm interested in X. And we're like, oh my gosh, have you connected with this office? They have all these events that are right along the line with what you're talking about. Um, and then in addition to having counselors there, we also have college academic mentors. They are um, graduate students who um, basically can help you plan your classes, whether you're whether you're preparing for a post-grad opportunity in grad school or something else completely. They have walked in your shoes. They made various decisions to get to where they are today, and they are um, fully uh, accessible and maybe a little less intimidating than talking to a full counselor if you're not sure. Um, you can kind of talk to them and along those lines too. We have peer counselors um, peer counseling programs where you can talk to other undergraduates who are also at UCLA to kind of pick their brains um, in a formal or informal setting, right? Um, along, so we're like one part of your team. If you have questions about like adding and dropping classes, petitions and things like that, we're also that office in addition to kind of like, how do we get you where you need to go? And then your department advisors, they are 
um, like the powerhouse resource when it comes to your major, your faculty in that major, the courses in that major, in that department, basically. So um, they're the ones that set their regular their eligibility, whether or not you can add their major as a double major or switch to their major as your primary or add one of their minors. Um, they also are the ones who are scheduling the classes and making sure that they are offering them. And so they'll know course availability. This is kind of like where they'll know that so-and-so, professor so-and-so is going on sabbatical. So the class that he usually teaches in fall is gonna be offered in winter next year. That's not something that we're going to know in the college, but your department counselor will know those things. They're also the ones who can help you with um, course substitutions. So one example is a sociology department has a requirement where it's basically like two required classes that they have to be these two social classes. And then, then there are these kind of like categories where just electives that you can take where you have to take social courses, right? That's not an exhaustive list because they've done petitions to approve other ones. And they've actually done the, the extra step of sharing what they've approved in the past. And you just have to ask for those courses or enroll in those classes and petition. Um, if there's something that you wanna take that you think relates to your major, but it's not on the list, you should talk to your department counselor about, can I take this for credit? The answer might be no, and that's okay. You can still take that class. It can still be one of your electives. It can still be an experience that you're collecting on your journey towards these goals. Um, all right, and then the other thing that they can do is that departments have various resources that um, are particular to their fields. They might have um, alumni events where you can connect with people who are working and who've gone on to other things. They might have industry partners, depending on the major that you're in. They will have, um, a host of student groups that are housed within the department too. And so talking to your um, department counselor would kind of like also connect you to all the resources that they have access to versus the more, the more specific ones to your field versus what we have is the more general college and UCLA resources. Um, am I missing anything there? Anything you, anybody else wants to add? All right. Nope, perfect. Okay, cool. So how do you connect with us? Um, we're gonna have the college advising connecting at the at the last slide where stay connected all the ways to connect with your college counselor. As far as your department advisors, a lot of times I go to the main department website and they all have kind of similar tabs across the top, um, academics, uh, people, uh, news, things like that. And usually under academics, you can find undergraduate um, or graduate, but the undergraduate one is where you're going to have links to who the department counselors are, how to connect with them, a lot of times how to make an appointment, when are they available, are there drop-in hours, um, and it's all, because the departments are all in their own separate little areas, some of them might use my UCLA to schedule appointments, some of them might use Calendly or some other way, but they will have all the details about how to connect with them there, all right? But continuing on that um, for more resources, like if you're like, I don't know if I wanna to talk to someone, I wanna to try to figure out as much as I can on my own, that's fine. There are a lot of resources that you can find online. My recommendation is that like in your classes, um, you can try to work through a problem on your own, but don't get stuck for too long. Attempt it and then if you're getting stuck and it's been, um, I don't know, just a, like a, What's too long? I would say don't work on something for more than 30 minutes and not make progress on it before either taking a break or asking for help, right? So that's where if you are in a class and you're stuck on a problem, that's the moment to go to office hours and get unstuck. Don't sit there and stare at the same problem for the next three hours. If you are not sure where to go for enrollment tips, if you're having trouble reading the schedule of classes, if you can't find your department website or DARS is really confusing to look at, um, or I've never looked at the catalog once, what am I supposed to do with it? Anything like that. Um, Tassels to the left is something that kind of has ten, like examples of degree plans that kind of complete all the requirements um, and the videos that we've been showing today. You know, anything that comes up, I would say start with us because we are a great place to kind of get you connected to people and also to help you kind of navigate these systems, you know? Um, you have a lot of things you're already managing, like 
yourself, your time, your classes, your goals, um, money, family, all those things. And so let us be a tool in your belt to help you with some of these other things where we can probably quickly explain the, or get you to a place where you understand all the moving pieces um, more quickly than you could do it on your own, which I think leads well into. Yeah, why do things on your own when you have a community here that can support you in it? So we wanted, so we talked a little bit at the beginning of this meeting about how all the, all the emotions, positive and negative, that can be sending us right now while we're talking about enrollment, while we're dealing with midterms, while our departments don't have appointments available, if you're one of our students here. Um, we've put together kind of some of these practices that have worked with us and our, our students in the past have told work with them in terms of maintaining our sense of wellness, our sense of personal wellness. Not all of these are going to apply to, well, okay, attend to your basic needs. That will apply to everyone, but not the rest, the rest may not apply to everyone, but we think that there's really great um, kernels here and, and finding what does work for you, what practices work for you to maintain that wellness is going to be super crucial for all of your enrollment times for all of your stressful midterms and final times, being able to really get back and centered into that that person that you truly are is really important. Um, so my so attending to your basic needs, making sure that you're getting food, water, and sleep is absolutely crucial for all of this. Um, but beyond that, some of these are things we've already talked about. So being uh, flexible and open to change, and there are str strategic ways you can be better at being flexible and open to change if you have lots of alternates already planned out, then a little bit of change is not super daunting for you. Um, we've got lots of great ones here. Don't compare yourself to others, staying connected with your support system, being patient with yourself and others. And I think that even goes into a little bit of, you know, if you've worked really hard for 30 minutes on this and you're not making progress, being patient with yourself and moving to ask questions is that kind of next step of, of maintaining your wellness and not driving yourself mad with some of these challenging circumstances. Um, does anyone have anything that they use, like any practices that you use to maintain your wellness in some of these times that you are willing to share with the group? Um, on the workshop or on the worksheet, there's space for you to write in great ideas that you hear if people are willing to share, or if none of these speak to you, write in what does speak to you. What practice do you use to maintain that wellness? And really take a moment to identify it and name it here uh, would be my recommendation. One that I don't see, but that I really do personally use in the moment counting to 10. It's, <laughs> it can be that simple for, for me to just kind of give myself a reset when I'm feeling overwhelmed. Does anyone want to share theirs in the chat or verbally? Even if it is one that you see already here, which of these kind of speaks most to you? Well, it's okay if you don't want to share now, but I'd love to see a thumbs up if you've taken a moment, just to recognize that you've taken a moment and acknowledge what practice does work for you. It's not necessary for you to share it all with all of us. Yay, thank you, Van. Thank you. Um, the whole point of this is that if you don't prioritize your wellness or yourself or something is going on that you're kind of trying to push through and it's not letting you, if you're not doing well, there's no way you're going to be 100% for your academics, mm. all right? So you are the most critical part of this entire equation. And that's kind of like the whole point of this is to look beyond enrollment, beyond just the classes you're going to add, you know, next quarter. I'm not worried about you, uh, you know, right now being able to graduate. That's something we can easily plan out. We can look for, we can check out what your options might be. That's a conversation with a counselor, you know, but these are the more important things to help kind of like drive you to kind of help maintain your motivation through those difficult times um, to keep going. And when you're not doing well, time and time again, when students don't do well, it rarely has to do with academics. It's always something else, you know? So this is why it's important to keep that in mind and to prioritize it. I'm not saying that I'm even good at that. <laughs> I know, but it's something that's like really important to do. Also asking questions, engage, you know, don't be afraid about how it might look to ask a question about something. Um, we want to make sure that you understand and you're advocating for your own understanding on every piece of it too. And we can get there, you know? Um, 
there's a million ways that you can kind of go about it. There's so many resources at UCLA and we're all tools in your belt. We're like kind of your team, you have your college advisors, your department advisors, you have your instructors, you have your faculty, you have your student clubs, you have your friends, you have all of these people that are here kind of as your network, you know, but you're still the center spoke, you know, the center um, of the wheel with the spokes reaching out. And so um, I just cannot emphasize this enough. All right, so take care of you so that um, everything else is a little bit less of a problem to solve. On asking questions, we won't be the only person you ask questions for, but here are some fantastic ways for you to stay connected with college academic advising and college advising, whether you're in our unit, AAP, honors or athletics, um, those are kind of our units in the college, or if you need to do a little bit more searching and connect with School of Engineering or the School of the Arts, if those apply to you and those are your kind of school uh, or college advisors. Our REACH virtual drop-ins for students who are in AAP and CAC are a fantastic resource for just connecting with someone for about 15 minutes, kind of short questions, great for questions about this coming quarter of enrollment. Hey, should I strategize this instead of this? What do you think of this as a backup for this other course? Um, they're really great for talking about enrollment coming up. And the wait is first come, first serve. You'll be seen on that day as long as you give yourself enough time to wait during our reach drop-ins. So if you're, you know, if you have a few quick questions, but your counselor is busy and booked through until December, reach can be a great resource for you to talk about this quarter. Message Center is a great way to contact your college advising units, as well as a lot of other advising units on campus, like in your major and minor departments. So always be checking through with that Message Center. Um, begin for the winter quarter. Enrollment appointments begin on November, first pass I believe begins November 14th for the winter quarter. Is that right? Um, no, November 9th, excuse me, November 9th for winter quarter. We'll probably go back to that as we get to questions. Um, 30 minute appointments, a lot of people have asked how to get more one-on-one -on -one advising in the longer term. We talked about a lot of different resources, 30, 30 minute appointments, and you can find that on our contact us page as well. But those appointments are really great to talk about, not just what am I strategizing for first pass versus second pass, but to get a lot of that information about how can I intentionally engage with my goals further on down the line. And our social media, if you're not following already, I do recommend following our Instagram and our Facebook. We don't we don't want to overwhelm you with info in our social media and pack it all in, but it's a great place to see something that you maybe wouldn't have otherwise Scene. Maybe that starts getting you thinking about something. Uh, our example is we made some posts a few weeks ago about iGetsy, and then a lot of students after those posts started coming into our Reach virtual drop-ins to ask about their iGetsy, and that is great. So our, our social media helped us to just, or helped our students just to kind of think about it. Wait, does that apply to me? And then follow up with us and ask more of the in-depth questions in our Reach drop-ins. Yeah, and um, before we just open the floor, I just want to show you an example of like, finding your department counselor um, by sharing this. Can everybody see the website? That's our CAC website. This is a link that I share with you guys in the chat that has how to connect with us, including the links to reach. It's every day, basically from 10 to three, um, a direct link to the message center, um, as well as how to request an appointment and what to include when you request an appointment. Now, does somebody want to share a department counselor from your major. Just I just need a department. Someone put their major in the chat. Anthro. All right, let's do Anthro UCLA. Oh, the Department of Anthropology. Fantastic. Let me just go to that website. This is where I was talking about where a lot of them have very common uh, tabs across the top. There's people where you might be able to get to staff to find your people. Um, your counselor, but more often you want to go to academics and undergraduate. And then you can see here information, including a lot of different things, but specifically advising is what I will go to. Right now it says TBD undergraduate advisor, and that is because they just hired someone. Her name is Mia and she is wonderful. Um, I've already had a chance to connect with her a few times, um, but you can see here where they're located. Um, not agree. Oh, and then here's the email that Mia has access to for sure. So you can definitely use this email to connect. Um, so that's how you can, that's how I find every advisor on campus. And I'll just reach out and say like, hi, I'm Alina. How can I connect with you? Um, but a lot of times they have specific things here. So let's do psych. 
oh, it already links out undergraduate program. I'm just going to go directly there. But you can see it again across the top, they actually pulled out their graduate and undergraduate. There's a psychology email list. There's admissions. You also want to do psychology undergraduate advising, which will open up. And you can see that they actually have specific um, psych enrollment workshops, right? They also have drop-in advisings in um, Pritzker Hall. They also have a probably message center to link here. So there'll be information about how to connect and make an appointment. And every single department has something like this. Every school has something like this. So if you are having trouble finding your person, we can easily help you look for that, but it should be a quick, um, hopefully just as easy to quickly do this. Not every website is created equal though, so I understand if it's more difficult to do, to find. Um, okay, so let's just open the floor to any and all questions about anything that we talked about, anything we didn't talk about. Um, we are here for you.